Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman history. Eunuchs were a constant feature of the Byzantine court and society for most of its history, and yet, because they played a servile and subordinate role to the men and women around them, they were often the instrument of someone else's story rather than their own. Even famous or infamous eunuchs such as Narses, Chrysaphius, and Theoctistos were the minions of the rulers Justinian I, Theodosius II, and Theodora the Armenian. To explore this section of Eastern Roman society, Romabu ramblings, Serapium Historia, and Eastern Roman history have combined to make three videos about eunuchs. Once you have watched this video, please check out their videos about famous Roman and Byzantine eunuchs, including Basil Lecapanos and John the Orthonotrothos. I have a final video about the last notable Byzantine eunuchs too. Please check out my collaborators' other content if you have not already done so, as they both make excellent videos on Roman and Byzantine history. Now, on to the video! A eunuch was a man who had been castrated. That is to say, they had their testicles removed. Byzantine eunuchs were used by the imperial court as reliable servants for the women's quarters, as well as government ministers. The use of eunuchs was quite ancient, and there is evidence of their use by that earliest of the great Iron Age empires, the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Eunuchs were used by countries across the Middle East, Greco-Roman world, and Asia, with the emperors of China employing eunuchs into the 20th century. The practice was adopted by the Roman Republic during its wars of expansion and through the slave trade. It was not until the Tetrarchy and the creation of what might be called an Oriental style of court system that eunuchs were catapulted into persistent political and social importance because they were employed as chamberlains and functionaries in the imperial palace. The Emperor Valens referred to the women's apartments as a phalanx of eunuchs. They were the only male servants allowed to enter the women's quarters. When a eunuch was bought, they were freed upon entering imperial service. After Justinian I's use of eunuchs as generals, such as Solomon and Narses, eunuchs could also become commanders and hold military office if they were appointed by an emperor or empress. Byzantine eunuchs were colloquially known as ectomai, or outcuts. Alternatively, they were also called entomai, or incised. How was a eunuch made? A 7th century doctor, Paulus of Aegina, provides our single technical account of how a eunuch was created. For those of a squeamish disposition, be warned. Epitome of Medical Science, Chapter 6, Part 68 There are two ways of performing the operation, one by compression, the other by cutting out. That by compression is performed in the following way. While the children are still infants, they are placed in a basin full of hot water. Then, when the body is softened, you press the twins with your fingers in the basin until they are broken up. The method by cutting is as follows. The man about to be castrated is laid down on a bench, and the scrotum with the testicles are grasped firmly with the fingers of the left hand and pulled. Two straight incisions are made with a scalpel, one for each of the twins. As they are pressed out, they are to be cut out, as they are naturally connected to the surrounding vessels by a thin bond. This method is preferred over that by compression, for eunuchs by compression retain a partial desire for intercourse, seeing as part of the twins seem to escape compression. If a boy was castrated before puberty, they would develop quite different physical features. They had no facial hair, their voice did not drop, they had longer limbs, were usually taller, had narrower shoulders, and broad hips. Fat accumulated around the chest, buttocks, and thighs more easily 
than their bearded counterparts. Eunuchs often resembled women, and so many monasteries warned against accepting eunuchs in case they were women in disguise. Mount Athos even banned eunuchs from joining their monasteries. The lack of a beard was their most distinguishing feature in a world where men were considered as such once they grew a beard, beardless men being boys. Thus, to distinguish between men and eunuchs, the Byzantines would refer to normal men as bearded. Eunuchs, although used by the imperial court, were prescribed by both church law and civil law. The church banned men that castrated themselves from becoming priests, and many monasteries separated men away from eunuchs. Furthermore, Roman lawmakers consistently outlawed castration, so many eunuchs were imported from abroad. Procopius tells us that one of the chief exports of Abascia in modern Georgia were eunuchs, saying Procopius, History of the Walls, Book 8, Chapter 3, Part 15-20. to Their kings used to take the boys of this nation, whom they noted as having pretty features and fine bodies, and dragging them away from their parents without the least hesitation. They would make them eunuchs, and then sell them at high prices to anyone in Roman territory who wished to buy them. They killed the fathers of these boys immediately, so that none of them might attempt at some time to exact vengeance from the king for the wrong done to their boys, and also so that they might not have suspect subjects. It was because of this that most eunuchs among the Romans, and especially at the emperor's court, happened to be a Bascoi by birth. But during the reign of the present emperor Justinian, everything has changed for the Abascoi, and made them more civilised. They have espoused the Christian doctrine, and the emperor Justinian also sent them one of the eunuchs from the palace, an Abascos by birth named Euphratas, commanding their kings, through him, in explicit terms to mutilate no male thereafter in this nation by doing violence to nature with the knife. This the Abascoi heard gladly, and taking courage now because of the decree of the Emperor of the Romans, they began to strive with all their might to block this practice. Foreign imports were not the only way the Romans recruited eunuchs. Some people were castrated by foreign invaders, and the law made provision for these by excluding them from prohibitive laws such as barring them from the priesthood. Others could be castrated for medical reasons, such as some testicular disease, which Roman families exploited to accidentally castrate their sons to then send them into imperial or ecclesiastical service. Several saints and generals, such as Justinian I's General Solomon, were castrated by accident. However, the operation held considerable risk. According to the new laws of Justinian I, three out of 90 people who were castrated actually survived the procedure. In AD 558, Justinian I banned castration and made it punishable with the loss of the perpetrator's property, exile, and, if they were a man, they were to be castrated too. Castration was later used as the punishment for bestiality by the Isaurian emperors. Roman law also barred eunuchs from adopting children, but this rule was abolished by Leo VI. It had been considered unnatural to bestow the ability to have children, which had been denied by nature, upon eunuchs. Leo VI abolished this rule in his new law 2627. He argued that it was not nature but man that denied eunuchs children and that it was unjust for the law to deprive them even further. As well as being barred from adoption for many centuries, eunuchs were also barred from marriage because they could not have children, which was confirmed by a law by Leo VI. However, in previous centuries, a passing mention by the orator Claudian implies that Eutropius, the eunuch consul, might have had a wife in the 4th century. Eunuchs were an embedded part of Roman and Eastern Roman society for many centuries. As such, many opinions were formed about them. For example, Byzantines considered angels to be similar in conception to eunuchs because they were neither male nor female. As a result, 
eunuchs were used as the artistic template for angels in their art. For the Byzantines, eunuchs were considered feminine men. A bad eunuch was often described with the vices used against women, such as indolence and lustfulness. A good eunuch was often described with masculine virtues, such as bravery and diligence. One of the main social debates about eunuchs was whether they were sexual beings. Since they were frequently employed to steward women and the women's quarters, they were considered to be very trustworthy. But many people did not agree. Cyril, Pope of Alexandria, warned against using eunuchs as custodians for women because they could still corrupt them with their hands and fingers. Anastasius of Sinai also pointed out that they could use their tongues to commit fornication. Basil of Caesarea and Basil the Bishop of Ancyra argued that eunuchs were chaste not because of their own virtue, but because of the knife, which made them even more lustful. While there are plenty of tirades against eunuchs, Theophylact, Archbishop of Orid, came to their defence during the reign of Alexios I, writing a defence of eunuchs. He did so because his brother was a eunuch and sick of the ridicule aimed at his brother and his ilk. The defence of eunuchs is a debate between a eunuch monk and a bearded monk. Theophylact argued that castration did not make a man good or evil, but that eunuchs were just like other people and should be judged on the contents of their character and conduct, that is to say to be judged based on who they were, not what they were. Regardless of Theophylact's protestations, eunuchs were universally seen as a feat and creatures of ridicule. Basil of Caesarea considered eunuchs to have the vices of both sexes, unwomanly, unmanly, lustful, envious, useless, fickle, stingy, hoarders, disgusting, dinner weepers, wrathful, greedy, bumpkins, effeminate, and gluttonous. Foreigners especially saw eunuchs in this light. Narses, the hammer of the Goths, was described by the Franks as a puny little man, a eunuch of the bedchamber, used to a soft and sedentary existence, and with nothing masculine about him. Agathias Histories, Book 1, Chapter 7, Part 8. A sentiment mirrored by the Byzantines. But they could praise a eunuch for their manly virtues despite their condition, such as in Leo the Deacon's account of Peter the Stratopedarch, saying, Leo the Deacon, Book 6, Chapter 11, For it is said that once, when the Scythians were raiding Thrace, it came about that Peter, although a eunuch, met them in pitched battle with the corps that was following him. The Scythian commander, an enormous man who was securely protected by armour, rode out on the battlefield, brandishing a long lance, and challenged anyone who wished to fight with him. And Peter, filled with inconceivable valour and spirit, impetuously urged his horse on with his spurs, and, after brandishing his spear mightily, thrust it with both hands at the Scythian's chest. The force of it was so great that it bore right through and pierced all the way to the broad of his back, his mail coat failing to stop it. That enormous man was dashed to the earth without a sound, and the Scythians turned to flight. By being close to the centre of power, many eunuchs could exploit their unique position to gain some political power for themselves. John the orphan Atrophos used his exceptional position in the court of Emperor Zoe to catapult his brother, Michael the Paphlagonian, into power, and later convinced her to adopt Michael V as her son. An expedient used by emperors and empresses was to resort to eunuchs as their agents, ministers, and confidants. While eunuchs might plot against the emperor or empress, they could never take the throne themselves, and so many rulers, who had an unstable hold and power, often resorted to employing eunuchs. Irene Sarantapakina heavily relied upon eunuchs during both her regency and personal reign. Constantine VIII, having spent much of his life in the sidelines of the palace while his brother Basil II ruled, employed eunuchs in many important positions because he had no other reliable base of support. 
Basil II himself was heavily reliant upon his uncle, Basil Lecapenos, during his early years, when the emperor was just 18 years old. Eunuchs also provided the emperors with a reliable director of affairs, even if how they pursued their sovereign's aims were not always the most popular or well received, such as Stephen the Persian, the Grand Chamberlain of Justinian II. The only eunuch to become consul, which still had considerable significance in the 4th century, was Eutropius in AD 399. However, he fell from power the following year due to the Gothic revolt of Tribigild and was subsequently executed. John Chrysostom and Claudian both gave speeches decrying the evils of Eutropius. No eunuch ever became emperor, though the eunuch Styracius did try during the reign of Irene. The exceptional circumstances of a woman becoming emperor potentially opened the door for him to do the same, though he died before he could. Emperors would use castration to eliminate the sons of deposed emperors from claiming the throne. Leo V castrated the sons of Michael I, one of whom later became patriarch. Michael II castrated the sons of Leo V. Later, Michael V castrated many of his male relatives to exclude them from the throne. Some of the emperors castrated their own children. Basil I turned his son Stephen into a eunuch and made him patriarch when he was 19 years old. Romanus I castrated his bastard son Basil, whose role as chamberlain saw him serve most of the 10th century emperors and became one of the most powerful eunuchs in the empire. Eunuchs had several official posts at court. The Nipsis Diarios held the emperor's bowl. The Cubicularius was in charge of the emperor's household. For example, Narses was Justinian's Cubicularius and in charge of his personal finances. The Sparthero Cubicularii were armed with ceremonial swords and formed the emperor's escort. They would carry around a sword with a golden handle. The Papias was a supervisor of the palace and responsible for lighting, keys, locks, and so forth. The Parakoimomenos slept in the imperial bedchamber to protect the emperor while he slept and ran his private apartments. They often served as a sort of prime minister in the 9th to 11th centuries. Eunuchs that bore titles were also prescribed more elaborate decoration in their court dress. However, eunuchs were barred from several roles. They could not become eparch of Constantinople, quaestor, nor domesticos of certain tagmata, but there were always exceptions. Gregory the eunuch was eparch of Constantinople in the 7th century, and during the 11th century, various emperors and empresses assigned eunuchs as domesticoi, even of the scholai, the most prestigious tagmata unit. This exceptionalism also went the other way, with Basil the Macedonian being appointed as Parakoimomenos by Michael III. As for careers, other than at the imperial court, eunuchs could be used as body servants by noble families or serve as clergymen. There are no stories of eunuchs working the land, and the fact that families mutilated their own children to give them better prospects implies that most, if not all, eunuchs were employed in imperial, aristocratic, or ecclesiastical jobs. The decline of the importance of eunuchs started with the reign of Alexios I, who ruled the empire more in the manner of a provincial aristocrat rather than the ancient style of civil service. Imperial family members took on far more important roles, and many positions that eunuchs had filled, such as parakoimomenos, were replaced by close family and friends instead of eunuchs. The Comnenian way of rule, though detrimental to eunuchs, greatly increased the importance of women. The Fourth Crusade and the capture of Constantinople was the nail in the coffin for the employment and prominence of eunuchs. Not only were slaves of the Eastern Roman Empire conquered, by various Western powers, such as Venice, the Latin Empire, and Genoa, but also their culture and ideas accompanied them, diffusing into the cultures of the remaining Orthodox powers as well. The restoration of the Eastern Roman Empire did nothing to rescue the importance of the eunuch. A Trapezuntine horoscope from 1336 ordered society in the following order. Emperors, grandees, grammarians and notaries, prelates and clerics, courtiers and commanders, 
abbots and eunuchs, noble women, merchants, envoys, actors, commoners, and people of the marketplace. It reflects the considerable decline the eunuch had undergone in the social hierarchy, even in Trebizond, which was least affected by the Latin conquest. However, eunuchs were still used and continued to function as loyal servants, particularly in the empress's service, indicating that their enduring qualities as sexually unthreatening and fiendishly loyal retainers were maintained even in the 14th century. By the empress's side is often where we see eunuchs in the written sources during the Paleologan period. Eunuchs escorted Anna of Savoy during her wedding to Andronicus III. The same was the case for Theodora Cantacuzine when she married Orhan Ghazi. The eunuch St. John of Heraclea started as an attendant to Theodora Paleogina, who was also the uncle of Nikiforos Gregoras, the polymath. Eunuchs continued to be used as diplomats. Michael Callicranites served as a messenger between Andronicus II and Andronicus III in the 1320s. In the Empire of Trebizond, eunuchs continued to have some prominence. In 1332, John the eunuch was Megas Duke, admiral of the navy during the Trapezantine Civil War, and played a major role in the conflict. On the other hand, at Constantinople, the last eunuch to command imperial forces was Andronicus Eunopolites in 1281, fighting Charles of Anjou near Berat. No eunuchs were ever appointed to important imperial positions during the 14th or 15th centuries. In the Paleologan and Trapezantine empires, only 19 eunuchs are known by name. To end the video, I shall quote a poem by Manuel Phyles, who wrote about eunuchs. Poems, Book 2, Poem 255 There is a race that lives in the heart of the palace, feminine compared to men, but masculine compared to women. It has traces of both, without being either one or the other. It has nothing to do with women, but its masculinity is eroded. It rules everyone, but is enslaved to all. It will dare anything, but trembles with fear before all. It hates laughter, but loves tears. Insignificant, but boastful by nature. A tyrannical, obsequious, cruel race. Decorous, humble, mindless, speechless, chatty, servile, violent, spirited, cowardly, greedy. Born of the mixture of extreme opposites. The greatest evil emerging from evil. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe, and also check out the videos by Romabu Ramblings and Serapium Historia. I would like to thank my patrons for their generous support, and this has been Eastern Roman History. Mm -hmm.